morning. Um, as a uh, disclosure, I have none except to say that I did not write that question. Uh, but I hope that we can answer it today. So I'm a sarcoma medical oncologist, a guest here, and uh, I'm going to talk about the most common uh, sarcoma of the gastrointestinal tract, which is GIST, gastrointestinal stromal tumor, a disease which has really been the poster child of targeted therapy in, in uh, sarcoma for the last 15 years. Um, previously, this was called a GI leiomyosarcoma, not really well understood, but around the end of the 20th century, it emerged that, that these CKIT positive or CD117 positive tumors developed from the, uh, most likely from the interstitial cells of Cajal, the pacemaker cells of the gut. And these are relatively uh, common tumors. As a single entity, they're probably the most common sarcoma, about 3,000 uh, cases a year in the U.S. Uh, in Western countries, it's an annual incidence of about 10 per million population. Very little effective therapy for these uh, diseases prior to the imatinib era. So we know, of course, that the vast majority of these tumors have activating mutations, most often in uh, KIT, which is shown on the left, and if not in KIT, then in PDGFR-related uh, receptor tyrosine kinase, with some important exceptions, which we'll come to um, later. So these activating mutations are found in certain hotspot areas, particularly exon 9 and exon 11 of the KIT protein, and also in the um, PDGFR uh, gene as shown on, on the right. And all of these, uh, conveniently enough, are quite sensitive to imatinib therapy. <clears throat> In terms of where these tumors arise, they can develop anywhere in the gastrointestinal tract, but most commonly in the stomach and the small intestine. But we do occasionally see them in the esophagus, uh, in the rectum, and those are sometimes very interesting and challenging management problems. So the um, standard of care for a gastrointestinal stromal tumor is surgical resection. And then the question after that is adjuvant therapy. So a number of groups have tried to clarify the risk stratification schemes of resected GIST to try to guide us into which patients should receive adjuvant therapy and, and which should not. There are a number of different uh, criteria and nomograms out there, and to some degree they overlap quite a lot. But the highlights are that three factors emerge in terms of risk for recurrence, and they are the size of the primary tumor, the mitotic rate, and the location. So quite simply, a, a, a non-gastric primary is higher risk, a larger tumor is higher risk, and a higher mitotic rate, defined as five per 50 high-powered fields, is a higher uh, risk. And a number of different nomograms are available. There's an MSKCC nomogram, which you can get if you just Google GIST nomogram, um, which is quite helpful. You can plug in all those variables and estimate the patient's five and 10 year recurrence free survival. And you can see here, for example, that a patient with a less than two centimeter low mitotic rate uh, GIST is gonna have a 95% 10 year recurrence free survival, and therefore it's hard to argue in favor of any further therapy. But that the patient with a large uh, high mitotic rate tumor um, is at quite substantial risk for recurrence, and that risk can be substantially reduced by imatinib. Um, and imatinib is um, very effective at targeting these uh, mutations <coughs> in uh, the kit tyrosine kinase. Um, the uh, initial study, um, which was really the uh, pioneering work from Lancet 2004 uh, demonstrated the activity of imatinib in patients with metastatic disease. So I'm going to talk first about the treatment of, of metastatic GIST and then we'll move into the adjuvant setting. So in the initial study there was um, a randomization between 400 and 800 milligrams of, ad, of, um, of uh, imatinib um, and these are patients who had untreated metastatic GIST. And as you can see the progression-free survival um, is pretty uh, similar between the two, a slight advantage to the twice daily dosing, but no difference in overall survival. So this really established 400 a day of imatinib as the standard of care for metastatic GIST. Um, note that green curve on the right, doxorubicin. So this is considered a chemo-insensitive disease, but in the pre-imatinib era in the 1980s and 90s, that's all there was. And um, th this is a historical control, not actually a randomization. That's just a superimposed graph. But it shows you that in the pre-imatinib era, after one year, 70 to 80 percent of patients with metastatic GIST had succumbed to disease. And that uh, now we now see over 80 percent uh, one-year survival. So it's really one of the most dramatic changes in, in sarcoma solid tumors. 
There is a hint that, that the exon mutation matters in terms of your response to, um, to imatinib, and, and in particular, it seems that exon 9 mutations are somewhat less sensitive to imatinib than exon 11, and some authorities think that patients who have exon 9 mutations may benefit from higher doses of imatinib. So patients with metastatic disease are treated with imatinib, often have excellent response, or objective response rates are 50% and up, and uh, prolonged progression-free survival. However, tumors do mutate, acquire secondary mutations and resistance to these targeted agents. And uh, imatinib resistance is a major problem in the clinic, um, often a few years after starting therapy for metastatic disease. So there are a number of options when the patient has clear disease progression. One is to uh, increase the dose from 400 to 800. This can be especially helpful if you know the patient has an exon 9 mutation. Um, there is a limited role for surgery, and I'll talk about that at the end, in patients with metastatic disease. But sunitinib, or sutinib, has been the, established now as the uh, second-line standard of care for patients with imatinib-resistant disease, and was FDA approved in 2006. So this is the uh, definitive registration trial for sunitinib in imatinib-resistant GIST. These are patients who are progressing on imatinib, and 300 were randomized two to one in favor of sunitinib. This is actually, by sarcoma standards, an extremely large study. This is a rare disease, only 3,000 cases a year, so this is quite an achievement to get this many patients on. And there was crossover at progression. Notice the dose. This is what's also used in renal cell carcinoma, which is 50 milligrams a day for four weeks every six. So these are the results in terms of response rate. And in percentage, uh, notice the response to sunitinib was 7%. So this is not a treatment associated with a high response rate in refractory GIST. However, a substantial proportion of patients did have uh, stable disease, uh, more than with placebo. Um, and this is what the progression-free survival curve looks like. So it has that typical stairway progression. Patients are scanned roughly every six weeks, and every interval scan, a, a substantial proportion of them uh, are found to have progressive disease. And you can see that the median um, progression-free survival on placebo is about one scan, or six weeks, which gives you a sense of how uh, aggressive the natural course is of metastatic gist when the patient is not being treated with a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And you can see that progression-free survival was substantially prolonged with sunitinib, median of, of 27 weeks, which is better, but not great. And you can see that ultimately, at least in these, this study, by a year, almost all patients have progressed. So I think the take home here is that sunitinib is an important palliative uh, for metastatic progressive gist, that responses are rare and should not be expected. You should counsel patients that what you're hoping for is stable disease, hopefully for a, a good period of months. So this established uh, sutentis standard of care, as I mentioned already. Um, most uh, sarcoma physicians usually prefer, I think, 37.5 milligrams a day of uh, continuous daily dosing with the idea that you're continuously hitting the tyrosine kinase um, and effectively blocking that oncogene. Uh, this has not, however, been uh, uh, tested uh, with randomized data. It has been tested and found inferior in kidney cancer. And then the third drug, um, familiar to this audience, I'm sure, is regorafenib, um, which was approved uh, in 2012 in the third line. So this is a similar group of investigators in a very similar study design, except we're now talking third line. Patients have progressed on imatinib and on sunitinib and are randomized to uh, regorafenib versus placebo. Uh, here is the response rate, again, very low, 4.5% response rate with regorafenib. Interesting, 1.5% response with placebo. Um, stable disease in 71% of patients. Um, and another variable to look at this is disease control rates of patients who achieve stable disease for at least 12 weeks. Um, about half will do so with regorafenib and less than 10% will with placebo. And you see, again, a very striking difference in progression-free survival with pretty dismal outcomes in patients on placebo. So again, this points out that patients who are progressing on um, tyrosine kinase inhibitor do very poorly when on a study with placebo. In fact, the Koreans have since done a study asking the question, should a patient with progressive GIST be maintained on some tyrosine kinase inhibitor, or should you just stop? And in fact, it's better to stay on imatinib than to stop cold turkey, because the disease can just be explosive after this. So this is probably the last randomized study that will ever be done with a placebo control arm. I think most people think that even in progressive disease, patients should be on some sort of tyrosine kinase uh, inhibitor in the palliative setting.
And then I want to talk briefly about pazopinib. So this was approved for uh, soft tissue sarcoma in general um, a few years ago and has interesting activity in a number of different sarcoma subtypes, Lyoma sarcoma and others. Um, and was also tested in a small phase two study in um, refractory GIST. This is interesting just because the drug is available um, for patients with metastatic GIST, uh, sorry, metastatic sarcoma and can also be used in patients with GIST. And here is the result of this study. Again, this is a heavily pretreated population, so you're, you're not expecting uh, dramatic curves, but the median progression-free survival here was a little under two months. There was no control arm in this small 25-patient uh, study. So a hint of activity and may be useful. Um, and they did an interesting thing here in this study. They looked at the same 25 patients and went back and looked at how those patients did when they were on imatinib, when they were on sunitinib. And I think you would predict these results, but it's nice to see it um, on, on paper. And that is that with imatinib, they did very well. You always get the most um, bang for the buck from the first-line therapy. With second-line therapy, with sunitinib, it was about seven months. And with pizopinib, about 1.5 months. But the occasional patient may see some benefit. So that's wrapping up briefly the treatment of metastatic disease. Of course, a lot of clinical trials are ongoing to find new agents for patients with acquired resistance. But now I'll talk about um, adjuvant therapy. So <clears throat> with the uh, remarkable effects in metastatic disease, imatinib was moved into the adjuvant setting. And the uh, first trial which uh, assessed this was an uh, uh, intergroup study which compared one year of imatinib, 400 a day, versus placebo in patients with GIST defined as a certain risk of recurrence, in this case, greater than three centimeters. <clears throat> And you can see here that there is substantial um, improvement in recurrence-free survival in patients with imatinib. Look at the x-axis. You can see that at 12 months, which is the duration of imatinib therapy, the progression-free survival, recurrence-free survival on the treatment arm is virtually 100%. Almost no one will have a relapse while they're taking imatinib. But you notice that once you stop imatinib at month 12, the curve starts to dip again, and the slope of that curve looks very much like the slope of the placebo curve, just shifted a year to the right. So this suggested that patients were having microscopic metastatic disease suppressed but not eliminated by imatinib, and that the moment you stop, the recurrences started to happen again. So the next logical step was to say, well, if one year is good, maybe three is better. And that was the next study done um, by the Scandinavian Sarcoma Group, again, a large randomized study. And it noted a substantial improvement in relapse-free survival in patients who receive um, a longer course of, of imatinib. And initially, when the data were first reported, there wasn't much of a survival difference. And people speculated that when patients on shorter courses of imatinib recur, they will be put back on imatinib and will re-respond and be salvaged that way. But in fact, it didn't quite work out that way. And there is a survival benefit to maintaining the imatinib um, in the first few years. And here's the curves. <clears throat> shown um, on the left, the recurrence-free survival. And again, you note that there are very few recurrences, although up to three years there are some in patients who receive adjuvant imatinib. But once it stops at year three, you can see that that curve drops down in a slope remarkably similar to the 12-month curve. So this established uh, three years of adjuvant imatinib as the standard of care. NCCN guidelines recommend at least three years. European guidelines recommend three years and then stop. Uh, the FDA has approved uh, imatinib for adjuvant therapy, but has not given any indication on the optimal duration. Um, <clears throat> there are not any further randomized studies planned. There is a single arm study of five years of imatinib, which will be interesting to see, particularly to see if at the end of five years, the slope of the curve begins to fall off the same way these one and three year curves have. <clears throat> so in terms of um, adjuvant therapy and GIST, we have a number of um, unanswered questions, how much is enough is not clear. At least three years, most, most experts agree. Um, the um, role, uh, and I was going to also say that if, if the patient's tolerating well without toxicity and if the patient is at substantial risk of recurrence, say a large, high-grade, small bowel uh, gist, uh, most of us at three years will just keep going um, because we know that the risk of recurrence is so high after you stop. The other question is the role of molecular testing, and different um, expert groups have different recommendations. But it probably does not change first, second, or third line standard of care. It is interesting to know if patients have rare variants like PDGFR, uh, D842V mutations, which are resistant to all existing TKIs. It is interesting to identify patients for appropriate clinical trials, since drugs are being developed to target exon 13, exon 17, other kit mutations. 
The, the um, <clears throat> treatment of wild type GIST is another interesting subject. So of course they're not really wild type. They have mutations in other genes um, other than um, KIT and PGFR. And those genes include RAS occasionally, uh, BRAF, case reports of responses to BRAF inhibitors, um, and uh, also uh, succinyl dehydrogenase loss, especially in um, pediatric GIST. So that's another very interesting area of research, but that's a very small uh, slice of the uh, patient population. Um, patients who have multifocal metastatic disease are sometimes considered for uh, surgery to resect metastases in the perineum and in the liver. Um, there is no prospective randomized data to guide us, but retrospective series suggest a couple of things. <clears throat> One is that patients that have multifocal progressive GIST while on tyrosine kinase inhibitor will probably not do well with surgery um, and will have very short uh, progression-free survival. Patients with disease that's under control with TKI therapy may benefit from a so-called debulking surgery to resect potential um, uh, uh, resistant clones, and patients who have most of the disease under control but a couple of progressing lesions do somewhere in the middle, which you might expect. That is all from retrospective series. The data also suggests that such operations are probably best performed in high volume centers of expertise. Um, neoadjuvant therapy is, is interesting. So an untreated GIST is going to have a greater than 50% response rate to imatinib therapy. So it's a very reasonable option to consider neoadjuvant therapy in patients with GISTs in difficult locations, particularly patients who have uh, rectal GISTs where the only surgery would be an APR. Often they can be um, downstage and have a sphincter sparing procedure. Uh, patients with esophageal GIST, uh, rare but not rare enough. Um, can undergo neoadjuvant therapy and possibly undergo a less invasive um, uh, procedure. The optimal duration of neoadjuvant therapy is also not clear. Most people believe it's in the range of nine months. Uh, we usually treat until best response and then refer for surgery. Unfortunately, best response is usually only identified in the rearview mirror. Um, and that's basically all I have to say about adjuvant therapy of GIST, and happy to take questions.